Aloha and welcome to Inside Hawaii Real Estate, a real estate show dedicated to providing up-to-date information and news to Hawaii home buyers, sellers, and investors. I'm Will Tanaka with my co-host, business partner, and wife, Leonie Lam, a realtor with over 20 years of experience in leadership roles in the Hawaii real estate industry. Thanks, Will. Will is a full-time realtor sharing his talents as a lawyer and a law school professor and the former head of a Hawaii title and escrow company. And together, Will and I work as a team to bring you the latest in Hawaii real estate. Today, we are one of the highlights of our show is that we want to simplify about the practice changes that are coming very soon across the industry of real estate nationwide and as well as locally here in Hawaii. And these practice changes are going to be having an impact and they're going to be happening within the next several weeks. So pretty timely information. Um, We're hoping that through our discussion, we can really help to simplify it so that you understand what this really means for you, what the changes are going to mean for you. So just generally, like when you look at our market here on Oahu, we have about 2,500 plus homes, condos, townhomes for sale right now. And so when you look across the market, you know, typically if you're looking to buy a place, you're looking at open houses. And so that's usually on Sundays or it could be during the weekdays. So not all listings are held open. A lot of times it's you can only see it through private appointment and there's various reasons for that. So when you want to go see a property, oftentimes you'll contact your realtor or a realtor and they will book a showing time that is suitable for your schedule and you guys go show and see the property. Well, in the next few weeks, all of that is changing. So, well, can you kind of get into how that's going to be changing? So starting on August 12th and August 17th nationwide, but in Hawaii, it's going to be Monday, August 12th. When um, you want to see a property, if you have private showing, you're going to have to sign what's called a buyer's representation contract. So, you know, when uh, you hire an attorney, you sign a retainer agreement, you give them money, right? You go to the doctor's office, pretty much interior designers. You're going to have them, uh, you know, usually sign some type of retaining, some legal binding document. So the custom and practice in Hawaii is that, yeah, you, you don't, buyers don't sign any agreements with the realtors, even though there has been a buyer's representation agreement in effect documentation wide in the last 20 years. So that's always been around, but historically, and just from a custom and practice, you know, we, we've never had our buyer sign a buyer's rep, um, contract. It's just kind of based on trust, making sure that we bring value. But as a result of the NAR, the National Association of Realtors lawsuit, this is going to be one of the, the uh, major uh, practical changes that's starting very soon. And um, we'll also talk about the change on the seller side. But when you're looking at the contract, right, it's like, oh, my God, wait, I just met you and you want me to sign this agreement for for a whole year. So I I think there's going to be a transition period and it's going to be a mindset shift, right? Because on the sell side, the seller always have signed the listing agreement in order for a realtor to represent you to sell the property. And usually that's been a one-year agreement. So uh, on the buy side, it's going to be just kind of changing the mindset. It's like, okay, now it's uh, Leone and I were talking about it and it's going to elevate, I think, our profession even more because, hey, you guys are signing this and we are real estate professionals. So it's kind of bringing the value and the worth. I mean, it just kind of brings me back to thinking like over this weekend for one of our buyers, you know, we got quotes for a new split air conditioning system because they're moving in, they're purchasing a place that doesn't have AC. So they wanted to know how much is it going to cost for me to get a new AC system? So we called an AC vendor, got them in to give a quote. But in order for our buyer client to get the new split AC, they got to sign a contract with this company saying that I agree to work with you and I agree that I will compensate you, right? And that's the only way that the AC vendor is gonna go in and install the new system. So in pretty much any service industry, I feel like there's always an agreement, like interior design. If you hire an interior designer, there's an agreement, like pretty much any industry. And for some reason, I don't know why it's been a situation for realtors on the buy side that we have never 
I mean, there are some that do have had buyer sign agreements, but for some reason, I don't know. Why do you think it's so weird? Well, like that we never did that before. I I, I think even when I was a buyer myself, you know, long time ago, it's just it's just the way it is, right? So it's one of those situations, I think, in all aspects of it, it's just leveling up our industry. And when it comes to the buyer's representation contract, mm -hmm. I, I think there's two things that's going to stand out. One is a timeline, right? So do you want to uh, commit to your buyer's agent for an entire year? Is it going to be six months? And oftentimes when um, prospective buyers find uh realtors on zillow for example so what happens is oh i want to see this property it pings to one of the local realtors who's paying for zillow leads and then you'll get this thing it's called a seven day touring agreement so it's the same thing as a buyer's representation contract but it's very limited seven days and then hopefully during that seven days the the realtor will want to earn that trust and the value show some properties and um, they'll hopefully engage longer than that. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I think um, there's going to be different forms of it, but a lot of a lot of consumers already have a realtor. You know, they've been working with someone, they've done past things with them, and so they already have a trusted realtor. And so it would behoove them to go ahead and sign a representation agreement with someone they've been working with, you know, for a long time, and it's going to be mandated in the next few weeks. And then for those people or buyers that are out there that don't have that relationship, it's a great opportunity because now they're going to have to sign with someone, right? Sign up with one realtor. And so in that case, they have this great opportunity to interview and find the right fit for them. So I think that's going to be, that's a plus for a consumer, right? If you're a buyer out there and you're, you know, yeah. you're going to want to talk to different ones and you're going to see who you feel you can trust, who you feel safe with who you think brings something to the table that you perceive to be valuable. And that's the same way like you would find an attorney, right? I mean, there's so many different attorneys. Like if you're going to look to do a trust or something, you'd go maybe meet with several attorneys and see who makes sense, who you feel comfortable with, who you can trust. And that's how you would, you know, then sign their agreement and pay the retainer like you were mentioning earlier. And then so in addition to the time period that where you're going to be engaging your buyer's agent, the second major point is going to be the compensation to the buyer's agent. So I think in terms of the mindset and in, in terms of the customer and practice, I think that's going to be even more of a surprise. And, and this is why we want to get the, the news out in terms of the buyer representation contract, because what's going to happen is there's going to be a line that says, how will you be compensating your buyer's agent's brokerage? So traditionally, I, I think... Um, the, the mindset is, well, the buyers don't pay the buyer's agent's commission. But let's say on a million dollar property, all the money, the earnest money deposit, additional deposit, if you're getting a loan, you know, all the mortgage amount, that's being paid to the seller. So you've all the buyer has always been paying the closing costs, the commissions. And what, what you hear is the word called decoupling. So now they're kind of separating out you know, who's paying for what. And at least from talking to our seller clients, homeowners, and even our colleagues in, in, in the industry, I don't know if it's there's going to be too much of a significant change in Hawaii. Yeah, it's, it's almost a status quo where at least all of our clients on the sell side have been okay with paying the buyer's agent's commission. So traditionally anywhere between 5% five, 5 to 6%. And you split that baby down in the middle, you know, two and a half to three percent to the listing agent, two and a half to three percent to the buyer's agent's brokerage. And I, I think for the most part, that's how it's going to be. So, yeah, we talked about how it's going to be changing for the buyers. They're going to have to, you know, commit to working with one agent, right, to even be able to get in to see a property on a private showing. Open houses are still open and public yeah. can go. Um, but for any private showing and most properties are not open. I mean, a lot of properties on in our market are not, don't have open houses for various reasons. So that's going to be a necessity, right. right? But then now let's shift over to the sell side. So like you're just yeah. kind of alluding to it, right? Um, can we kind of talk about the, the, the re rationale or like, what are, you know, what we're hearing from our own sellers? 
Yeah. So the first question when we go to a listing presentation is, hey, I heard about the NAR lawsuit. Do I have to pay the buyer's agent's commission? Can we just pay you guys the two and a half, three percent and then not pay the buyer's agent's commission? And our answer is, you're absolutely right. You do not have to pay the buyer's agent's commission. But this is what's going to happen. And these are the various scenarios, right? One is going to be if the buyer signs a uh, buyer's rep contract for, let's say, 2.5%, and then the seller is not going to be paying any of that. So now the buyer feels like, wow, I'm bu buying a million-dollar property. And I have to pay 25000 out of my own pocket to the buyer's agent. So then they my first reaction is, you know what? I'm going to just represent myself. Unrepresented buyers are probably, from a liability standpoint, like the scariest type of buyers <laughs> because they might not be as familiar with the whole process. And, you know, what what's often happens um, is post-closing, after everything closes, things go wrong with the property. That's when they make a huge deal, right? It's like, hey, seller, I didn't know about this, even though they had every right to do, a, do, do their do, due diligence. So unrepresented buyer could be one result of not paying the buyer's agent's commission. Second one is dual agency. So the buyer might say, hey, listing agent, the, the seller's you know, uh, real estate agent, can you represent me as well as a buyer? So now dual agency, that's where um, one agent represents both the seller and the buyer. So it's mm -hmm. actually legal across the nation in Hawaii, it's legal, but Leone and I, and there's you know a number of agents who just choose not to do dual agency because then you're not really representing both sides. You just have to be a neutral facilitator when it comes to um, you know, when it comes to numbers and negotiation and th there's an emotional component to it, it's like you got to be a little bit more neutral. Or I mean, you have to be neutral. So I think that's where in a dual agency situations, no one ever feels like they were represented. For example, in litigation, right? Anytime, I mean, most litigations, lawsuits settle. They never go to trial. Mm -hmm. So when they settle, no one walks away very happy. You know, it's like, oh, I could have got more or I got less than I should have. So that's the often the feeling of a dual agency situation. That's substantiated too by real feedback that we've actually heard from people who, from consumers who have been in that situation and they have right. vocalized that they weren't satisfied. So, I mean, yeah, I've definitely heard that. Yeah. And, and, and then um, there could be smaller pool of buyers be, because if, if um, the compensation is zero, for example, to the buyer's agent and the buyer really loves their realtor and they want to be compensated, they're like, oh, okay, well, I, I definitely want to work with you. I don't want to be represented by anyone else. So I'm not sure about this property. So there could be a smaller pool of buyers, but just remember one of the it, it's it could all, always be kind of negotiated within the offer price because you know as we talked about right now the buyer pays pretty much for everything. The seller, right? I mean they probably put in work to sell the property. They would have to pay the the, the commissions, but all the money is actually just coming from the buyer anyway. Mm -hmm. So part of it is just kind of switching gears in your brain and saying, well, it's trying to separate on the documents, but in reality, that that's how it's always been. And it could work out that way. I mean, like you said, the final option where the seller doesn't pay the buyer's agent or the buyer's brokerage commission, but then they end up, the buyers end up negotiating it as part of their purchase anyway. Exactly, yeah. Right, so it kind of yeah. just depends, right? So right. yeah, yeah, so lots of, so... I think some of our clients have actually told us that in terms of, you know, paying the buyer's brokerage commission aspect of it. And the reason why you were saying before, like, it seems like it's status quo is because they have vocalized to us that they feel it's almost like, it's almost like liability insurance, you know, to actually continue the, the practice as it, as it was, because yeah. they want to have representation on the other side. You know, they have representation on their side. They want the buyer to have representation and it's kind of like a like liability insurance yeah, and I, I think talking to the the homeowners um they also feel like now it's going to be a competitive advantage if they do offer commissions 
or or the the standard commissions to the the buyer's agents. Oh, because as opposed to other listings that don't have offers of any buyer's comp buyer's brokerage compensation, that's why. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I I think especially um in this market right now, the buyer is getting very savvy. They're they're the most educated, like everything's online, right? Yes. So they, they come into um the open houses, they ask excellent questions, mm -hmm. you know, about permits, square footage, how does the roof, you know, any disclosure issues. I mean, excellent questions. So the buyers in this market, they're they're savvy, they're um educated, very knowledgeable. And let's be honest, there's there's like less buyers in, in our current market, at least here locally, right? I mean. There, there are buyers, but there's not as many as there were over the last several years when the interest exactly, rates, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. interest rates today, you know, we're back in the sixes, the high sixes, and it kind of, you know, vacillates here and there, but even because, well, more so because of the higher interest rates, it's tougher for people to buy a home here in Hawaii. And that's why I think, um, you know, talking to there's seven escrow and title companies in Hawaii. Talking to many of them, they said it's, in terms of the number of transactions, it's very slow, especially for the summer month. Because we initially thought there was going to be a late, you know, kickstart to the summer. But overall, in terms of inventory, it, it's just been still low. And it depends and it, completely on the neighborhood, right? Because there are certain, I mean, across the board, like when we're looking just from all the showings and also the things that we work on ourselves, like, you know, talking to other colleagues and things like that. I mean, it has been slower, but in certain neighborhoods that are desirable for, you know, the, the or, or the structure the house itself is desirable. We're still seeing multiple offer situations. Yeah. Yeah. Super competitive, but it depends. But overall, even rental market, the rents seem to be not commanding as high rents anymore. You'll see a lot more cancellations. You'll mm -hmm. see a lot of back on the market. And usually it's one of three things. One is during the J1 home inspection due, due diligence period. They'll do their home inspection. They'll find a lot of things wrong with the home. They try to negotiate repairs or credits. Seller thinks it's too much. And it, it'll just cancel. Go back on the market. Another could be insurance issues. Uh, especially for condos and townhomes, if it's not fully insured. And I think there's at least 300, maybe even 400 from, you know, talking to Sue Savio um, a few weeks ago. So insurance, because it's not fully insurable, the, the lenders won't lend. And, and the that's, buyer for can't finance. that's for condos and townhomes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then also for um, anything with associations, um, we just know without naming specific buildings, you know, one has major spalling issues. And even though their regular monthly maintenance is about a little bit over a thousand dollars for the next six months or so, they're paying 3000 over uh, 2000 special assessments. And that's a huge hit for any homeowners. So it's, um, it, it's a very interesting market. Um, and even when it comes to single family homes, you know, the homes, a lot of them are older, right? Built in the 60s and 70s. So in terms of insurance, I mean, if it's single um, uh, single wall homes, it's, I mean, it's good in terms of it's redwood wall, it's more termite resistance, but from an insurance standpoint, if it's not double wall and how old is the roof, I mean, you could be paying a little bit more premium in annual homeowner's insurance. Do you think like in this market from what we're seeing, I mean, do you feel like sellers are being reasonable in their pricing or do you feel like, you know, there's increased number of price reductions lately? I, I think just overall, the sellers are still thinking COVID, the pandemic, um, let's test the market. So uh, unless they're in a, a dire straits to really price it low, um, I, I think there's, a lot of the sellers are still testing the market by mm -hmm. pricing over. And then, you know, from the buyer standpoint, whatever the price point is, they they kind of see it as a sticker price where, okay, that's not the price. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure the sellers are willing to go lower. And again, I mean, it doesn't happen in all neighborhoods. I mean, 
our Diamond Head um, listing on Kahala Avenue got a total of about four offers. Our Kanyo Head listing got over nine offers, close, you know, over a hundred thousand asking price. Mm-hmm. Um, our buyers have bid and lost. Sometimes they've won. Sometimes they've lost. They got outbidded just recently. Yeah, so true. So true. So it really does. I mean, and sometimes the marketing strategy is to price this slightly under market value because now there's emotions like, oh my God, it's priced under market. We're going to go over, over the top. One thing that I've noticed about sellers and not necessarily our, you know, our sellers, but sellers, when I'm looking and researching and analyzing property is that um, they're, you know, sellers are typically selling because maybe someone passed away, so they need to sell, but they're also selling when they purchased for some reason in the year, like 2021, you know, and it's hard because I think when they're looking at the sales price in today's market, because they purchased in 2021 and they probably overbid for their property now to even break even, they have to list at a certain price. And it depends on their neighborhood, whether the appreciation has happened for them to the, to that level. Right. So potentially they overpaid back in 2021 because interest rates were low so they could afford the monthly. And now that they're trying to sell it, I feel like they're needing a certain amount just to break even so that they don't lose money. And in those cases, it's difficult and it's hard to palette for a buyer, right? Because they're doing the math and they're like, it just doesn't line up from a price per square foot basis, but yet this is what the seller needs, right? Yeah, that's a great point because I remember back in 2021, Leone actually predicted, especially people who are moving here because of the pandemic, it's convenient, it's a great place to be during the pandemic that, you know, she always kind of asked like, I wonder how long they're going to be here. And, yeah. and, you know, part of it, it's 2024, three years later. Part of it is, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of military buyers back in 2021. Now they're being, I think this is uh, towards the end of the PCS season where they're mm-hmm. getting military orders to move back to the mainland or, you know, even outside the country. So that that's part of the, the uh, seller pool. And mm-hmm. then there's some listings where they say, you know, 2.375 VA loan assumable. So there's not very much, but there are some of that. Those transactions take a little bit longer, you know, anywhere between three to six months. So, but there are VA assumable loans and you don't have to be a veteran to assume it, but you know, there's a a lot of other requirements regarding that. But the other segment is, you know, it's like the, the people who moved here, and then I think they just kind of realize, or maybe they have family issues back at home. Uh, they don't yeah. have family here. It's like one issue, like one person and their family to get sick or something. And they realize that the distance, you know, between where they were to to where they are now here in Hawaii, it's, it's far. And yeah. so it draws them back. And I've heard that story over and over again in, you know, the showings that we go to and things like that. So it seems like it's kind of coming to fruition. With respect to veterans. And, you know, with the, the whole commission and the buyers signing the buyer rep contracts, um, and usually for a VA loan, the the buyer, the VA buyer cannot mm-hmm. pay for any costs, right? So right. Um, that, that's the whole point. I mean, oftentimes they don't put any money down. They get 100% financing, which is awesome, right? They serve their country. So now before um, they wouldn't allow, from the buyer standpoint, to, to pay the buyer's uh, agent's commission. But I think within the last month or so, the Department of Veteran Affairs will now allow veterans to pay their real estate agent's commission or the buyer broker fee. Temporarily, so, right? I mean, Temporarily, have, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a temporary change because it was basically the new practice changes that we talked about earlier from the settlement that we're going to be implementing you know, shortly in the next few weeks. It was going to really impact the VA buyers One of the more common questions that we get from our clients or at the open house is, okay, is it a buyer's market? Is it still a seller's market? What is it? Right? I think it's balanced. It's kind of neutral. I mean, it really, it, it feels like it's much more neutral. Like we're talking about not significant price drops, you know, across the the island, but there definitely is price 
we're seeing more pricing reductions and things like that. But generally speaking, um, it still really comes down to the neighborhood and the desirability of that neighborhood and the location of the house, you know, within that neighborhood even. Yeah. So like you were mentioning earlier, there's still multiple bid situations for certain properties and then there's not yeah. for others. So, you know, it's kind of balanced. I feel like um, we've been I think in June, which is typically like you were mentioning earlier too, it's a busy season usually for real estate. You know, there's a lot of people out there looking, selling, buying, and it was it was quiet. It was a lot quieter, I think, in for our listings. You know, in June, yeah. and we heard that across the board. Yeah, and, and then you know, in terms of from a, the the buyer standpoint, it, you know, because they're a um, little bit more calculating in in terms of they want to really understand. I mean, there's an emotional component to buying a house, right? but in terms of there's a lot of Excel spreadsheets, sometimes depending on the client, there's a lot of number crunching. Some people purely go by the price per square feet of the interior. They also do a separate analysis for the land value. Mm -hmm. And like the analysis is getting to a whole nother level, right? Some buyers and sellers, they don't really care about the numbers. It's like, okay, what could we sell it for? Or we really want the house. And then from the buyer standpoint, so there, there's always, if you're buying a condo or a townhouse, there's always four ways to cancel. We call it the out clauses. There's four active out clauses to cancel a transaction and still get your deposit back. So we always say it's risk-free, right? It's refundable deposit. It's a J1 home inspection period. It's a review of the condo docs. That's well, I don't think the... it's completely risk-free because they have to pay the cost for inspections and due diligence, right? So there's going to be some cost that they're not going to recoup if they end up not moving forward. Uh, great point. <laughs> yes. And yeah. I know what you're saying. The initial yeah. deposit, which is substantial and all of that is refundable up until a certain point, as long as they stay within their contingency time frame. So yeah. that makes sense, you know, totally. I mean, just kind of to summarize it all, we kind of covered a lot of ground, you know, I feel like over this, this discussion, but really just to simplify it, there's practice changes that are coming and the way that it affects you is when you buy and sell real estate. So if you are in the market, you know, please kind of think about who you want to work with in terms of a realtor and know that you're going to have to kind of commit and sign up with one of them, you know, and it could be the one that you're already working with that you have a great relationship with. That's great. And if not know that you have the power to interview and find the right fit for you. And then on the sell side, you absolutely don't have to pay the buyer's brokerage, any commissions. However, a lot of sellers right now are viewing it as liability insurance. You know, they're viewing it as I'm going to have a competitive advantage if I do. And that's what we're seeing. And so we wanted to make sure that you had that information and just to simplify all the all the noise, because there's going to be more noise coming out in the media about these things. And so just from a super on the field, boots on the ground perspective, that's what we were trying to share. So thank you very much for watching uh, Think Tech Hawaii, Inside Hawaii Real Estate. And we'll see you again soon. Aloha.